right, everybody, we are live. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of Luncheon with the Experts, a Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I will be your host today and every week. And I've been working with CCF for a long time now, almost a decade. And, and, and my job is to, is to create video content that helps carry out CCF's mission, which is to, to raise awareness and, and, and educate people about neuroendocrine tumors. And I, I absolutely love this series and it's, it's given us such an opportunity to, to carry out that mission. And uh, the feedback that we get every week from you all at home is, is outstanding. And so Luncheon with the Experts is, is such a great program and I'm happy that you are joining us here today. And if you are, let us know where you are in the world. That's one of my uh, favorite things. One of our favorite things to, to see is how far this reaches and, 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 and where people in the, in the net community exist. And, and it's really an enjoyable aspect of it to see like, oh my goodness, there's people all over the world watching. So say hello, let us know where you are in the day. And this is Luncheon with the Experts. So if you're eating, let us know what you're eating. I don't really eat too much in the mornings, especially for these shows. So I have my little seltzer water here in my Luncheon with the Experts uh, mug, but let us know what you're, what you're snacking on today. Hopefully it's something healthy, healthy, or at least something that makes you happy. Uh, before we get started, I want to say that CCF, uh, Luncheon with the Experts, is made possible by the support of Lexicon Pharmaceuticals, so we really want to thank them. And we have a message from them that we, that we want to say, a disclaimer that says, the opinions expressed by the guest presenters, as well as the questions asked by the audience that you at home have not been created or suggested by the, the sponsors of the Facebook Live program uh, ahead of time. And CCF does not endorse nor promote any of the views, opinions, or information provided in the presentation. And audience members, again, that's you all at home, should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guest presenter and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. And so all that's saying is, you know, our guest today is going to give you some information and hopefully we're going to help you uh, take another step or two along this journey in the right direction. But by all means, you know, we don't know your case. Speak with your, you know, your team at home that knows your case very specifically and make a team, team decision. So today our guest is Dr. Eloisa Soares. Did I nail it? Yes. Close enough? No, I, 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 I did it. I, I practiced all weekend. Um, oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, but welcome. Tell us a little bit about, uh, about yourself. Where do you work? What do you do? And, and how do you serve the neuroendocrine cancer community? All right. So first of all, thank you so much for allowing me to be here. Um, I love the opportunity to engage with patients. I think that's part of my duty as an oncologist. So I am originally from Brazil. That's where I did med school. That's where that's my accent. And then after I finished med school, um, I came to the U.S. Did about five years of clinical research and outcomes health research at Moffitt. Um, a cancer center in Tampa, where Dr. Strasberg is. Yeah. Um, um, later on, did internal medicine in, in uh, Miami, the Mount Sinai um, Medical Center of Florida. Went to UCLA in Los Angeles and did my fellowship and my PhD in molecular biology. Came back to Moffitt to work as an early career uh, faculty, and actually that's what I had the um, awesome mentorship of Dr. Um, Strasberg. Um, he mentored me so well that I got recruited later to um, help to build the neuroendocrine tumor program in New Mexico, the University of New Mexico, where I was for um, two years and a half. And now my, my final stop is at uh, University of Utah. So right now I am at University of Utah at the Huntsman Cancer um, Institute in Salt Lake City. So I'm neighbors with Dr. Mark Lewis, who is in Intermountain. Awesome, awesome. Who is man. a very... Uh, a uh, well-known um, physician and patient advocate in the neuroendocrine tumor um, Absolutely. Need as well. And a special shout out to Dr. Strasberg, who, uh, who we've mentioned, who has been on the show yeah. uh, and on last year's show and in some of our videos. Uh, he is an, an excellent resource and, and uh, person in this community. And we were happy to, to feature him. And I even got him to crack a smile a couple of times. So I feel like I did my job well. Um, and before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and, and out the gate ask you the toughest question you'll probably have today, which is who is your favorite Brazilian football player? Well, all time is obviously Pelé. Um, okay, fair. <laughs> um, and, and now we know it's Neymar. So do yes. you have one? I mean, we were talking about so soccer before. We were. When we did our test, everybody at home. So uh, I'm a soccer player. I had on my, my shirt that day and we were talking about that. And if you're an American soccer player, it's hard to cheer for the state sometimes. So 
Dr. Suarez and I aren't, aren't you know, we're, we're on the opposing sides because I'm a fan of Germany, of Deutschland. Um, so there's a little <laughs> rivalry there. However, when I grew up, it was Ronaldo, number nine Ronaldo, Brazilian Ronaldo, not to be confused with Cristiano yeah. today. So that's who I watched growing up, who was just uh, amazing back in, in like the 90s. And so he, he still stands out. But of course, Neymar, uh, Ronaldinho and Pelé, you know probably the best of all time did so much for the game but uh yes yeah, so i love that that we have that in common and i miss my league that i uh haven't been able to play in in six yeah. months because we are still dealing with this issue yeah um but yeah all right before we get started i just <laughs> want to move along and you know today we're excited to talk to dr suarez about a variety of issues so go ahead and send in your questions um about anything she has given us her time today and she she's willing to take any questions She's not nervous. Nothing's off limits. Bring the questions in. She's ready to go. Um, and so we really like to take this, sh this show and, and, and dive a little bit deeper. It's not so topic based, but really we learn about the people who make up this community and, and what I, how I like to say it, how they serve this community. So send in your questions. If we can't get to all of them, which we, you know, admittedly, we, we, it's hard to do because sometimes we get hundreds of questions to get to in an hour. But if we don't, I encourage you to follow up with CCF either here on the Facebook page, you can send them a message, or at carsonoid.org, you can uh, send them an email there. And another thing I asked this last week um, that you can do to help me do my job better, which is to, to get to, to some of these topics that we want to discuss, is if you see a question come across, I love the side comments that happen um, in the show that you all helping each other and sharing your stories, that's really important. But if you see someone ask a question that you also want the answer to, or you think it's an important question, just go ahead and like that question. And it kind of upvotes it. So when I'm scrolling through and I see that, uh, it lets me know that there are more than, you know, more than one, one person that want to get to that topic. And then, then I can make that decision to, to choose that. Um, and before we get started, I just want to say one last thing that we know how challenging it is being a net patient, especially being a net patient in the pandemic, trying to get a diagnosis, um, it's, it's a struggle. And so we want you to know that CCF is here for you. Uh, and we vow to be here for you whenever, however you need us. And if you'd like to show your support in return to CCF and, and help us continue to create programs like this, an easy way to do that is with a donation in any size can help. And an easy way to donate is by texting the word experts to the number one nine one four three eight zero seven three two three again that's texting the word experts to nine one four three eight zero seven three two three and and honestly any donation makes a difference and so that that helps that helps us continue to do the things that that we like to do um so obviously dr suarez and i could talk about football or soccer as we know it in the states all day but uh with respect to your your time at home we won't do that we'll save that for another chat that we have but i have to say i have to start it off we have big news we have a big announcement that i, I want to take a moment and, and call attention to and, and congratulate you on so we just had an announcement that um that you received the Nanets 2020 Theranostics Investigator Scholarship, also known as NTIG Award, which is a, a two-year scholarship for $100,000. So I want to dive into that and understand, first of all, <laughs> first of all, for those like myself that may not know exactly what this means, um, it, it says that the NTIG is intended to push forward the boundaries of molecularly targeted radionuclide therapy and diagnostics for patients with, net, with neuroendocrine tumors, with NETs. So first of all, you know, what does it mean to you uh, and to, to receive this? And, and you know, what does it mean in terms of how you can use this to impact the community that you seek to impact? Okay. Thank you for the shout out um, about the, um, the award. So um, this is very important and I'm very thankful to the uh, Neurodoctrine Tumor Society and, its, and the sponsors of, of this um, award. And there's also two other awards that have been given for, trans for more basic science and clinical science. So for the Terranostics one that we are developing, essentially we have PRT, right? Mm -hmm. Which is this nadir nucleide, uh, peptide that we can um, give to the patients and it is essentially delivering radiation directly um, to the tumors that express a somatostim receptor in the surface of the tumors. Um, that's a way to guide the radiation specifically to that. And PRT um, is a wonderful treatment for patients um, 
has proven to have a significant benefit a few years ago, has been approved in the United States. Dr. Strasberg actually was the lead author in the paper um, that was published in New England Journal of Medicine for that. Uh, but it, PRT uh, doesn't work for everybody or doesn't work um, that long for everybody. So we're trying to uh, figure out strategies to make PRT better. So if we combine PRT with some um, additional drugs in combination, will that make PRT better? Um, and that's one of the things that we'll be studying in this um, uh, preclinical work. So this study is uh, will happen in mice. They have that um, will develop neuroendocrine tumors or that we implant tumors with um, their neuroendocrine tumors and we will treat the patients who the mice with the with this uh, particular group of drugs and then give the mice uh, P PRT and see if the mice that we combine the treatment, um, they have a better response to the treatment. If, if we see that this is promising indeed, then we'll take to the next level that is testing in uh, patients. So that's super exciting. Um, and I'm very blessed to be here um, with a group of scientists that can allow us to do that. You know, it takes a village to do research, uh, to take care of patients and to do research. And I couldn't have done this uh, or even the proposal to put it forward without the collaboration of uh, many folks here at the University of um, Utah. So that's exciting. We will be working really hard on that in the next two years, and hopefully we'll achieve the results that we expect to achieve and move forward later to patients. Let's, can we talk about that a little bit? What are the results that you hope to achieve? What, what are you hopeful for with this? And obviously I know there's a lot of different directions that can go, but, but you know, what, what would you, what would be a success for this? Like what, what do you hope that it can achieve? So that for the preclinical model, um, that we don't follow the mice for years, right? Because right. they will uh, uh, pass away. So we hope that combining uh, the treatment with the drugs and the PRT, the tumors will shrink more, and then and then we will grow in a much a slower pace. Mm -hmm. And if we see that compared to just PRT by by itself, then I think we are in a good position to move to clinical trials um, using combinations. Amazing. There are a few, a few, there are a few clinical trials already. There have been done combining. This is another strategy that we can handle. We think some of these drugs, um, uh, these hedgehog inhibitors, they might help to make the expression of the somatostein analogs um, uh, bigger. So perhaps we'll be able to target tumors even more. Amazing. And you know, Dr. Suarez is, is humble, uh, but this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. And so um, congratulations. I'm, I'm really proud of you for that and proud of, of, of the work you'll be able to do for it. And I know the community is too, because when, when we said this, I saw a flood of heart emojis uh, coming through on, on, the Facebook, on the Facebook, which um, is the easiest way to tell us that people are loving uh, what they're hearing. And for those of you back home, that's also a really great way for you to let us know I always ask for this. I always pander for for uh, uh, <laughs> positive reinforcement, but to let us know that we're doing our job well is is seeing those as a visual thing that I can see on the screen that lets us know, like, hey, we uh, we hit a home run on that one. And so, congratulations, honestly. And for those watching, this is a big deal. And and I know Dr. Suarez will will use it in the greatest manner in which he can help uh, help the net community. So, congratulations once again. Um, Thank you. I see, you know, I, we ask everybody on the top to tell us where they're from. And I see we have people from, from England. We have people from Nepal already. Uh, hi, Janet from the Chicagoland Neuroendocrine Tumor Network. Um, Finland, nice. Scandinavia, wow. I love it. And also special shout out to Karen Ann from Coastal Carolina. That is my home country. That is my place. Where are you from? Let me know because uh, I'm actually headed there this weekend. But that, I grew up in Little Washington. So, um Welcome everybody. So um, I'm going to get to some questions uh, in a moment, but something that we we talked about when we we always everybody at home always do a little test with the guests beforehand to make sure all the you know the the, the systems are operating and we, we've got the setup how we want it, and so it gives us an opportunity to chat beforehand. And so of course we learned that we we're both soccer fans, but I also wanted to talk a moment about you know your your passion in this community. You brought up a word that comes up a lot and it triggers the, the you know, emotional part of me because I'm here for, for the patients. I'm not a doctor, I'm nowhere close to it. But I, I'm a humanist and I love, I love to help people and I do that through storytelling. 
Um, but you told me like how big of a, a patient advocate you were. And so I'd like to know a little bit about, you know, why you're drawn to this, the, to, to this disease and more about your purpose. I mean, everybody's in it to do their job, what the skills, you know, using the skills that they have, but you seem to be driven by a, a deeper mission. Can you talk to me a little bit about that thing? Like, what is it that drives you? Why are you so focused on, you know, on research, on really working on behalf of the patient? Yeah, no, thank you for the question. That's, um, I knew that I want to take care of um, cancer patients probably since um, the end of my high school. Wow. Um, my, um, I, I had few fam family members in my family with cancer and mm. my grandfather didn't have um, a good passing, I call it. I, I remember being very traumatized by the way that his end was. And then on top of that, when I was in high school, my dad was diagnosed with a um, very rare type of cancer in the, in the head and neck in his face. And then he went through multiple surgeries and, you know, um, he was without visible disease for a very long time, probably for more than 10 years. And then his disease um, came back and become visible. So I had to, you know, he had to go to several other surgeries, which were kind, um, very aggressive surgeries that I can see the deafness that he has um, um, from that. And he he's, has active disease now. And we actually decided to um, elect the watch and wait approach instead of mm -hmm. going for more surgeries, which we do sometimes with neuroendocrine tumors. So from that standpoint, I, I it's a little bit of my passion because I, I see as a caregiver and a daughter of someone, um, someone that has a more slow growing tumor and all the decisions that have been done um, uh, related to that. I also love science and I feel that oncology is an amazing place to, to, you know, to study and, and go back to the lab. And the, another way that I end up coming to neuroendocrine tumors is actually really learning from um, Dr. Strasberg, right? He, they were hiring someone. I wanted to go back to Florida because of of a family, my husband is from Florida and end up um, uh, being his um, mentee. And boy, that guy is smart. <laughs> so you know, l learning from him is it, it was amazing. So all these things made me uh, become passionate about neuroendocrine tumors. And the personal experience um, and listening to patients is the way that I try to advocate for them. And now there is a American Cancer Society ASCO has a um, uh, advocacy group. Um, once a year, they go to Washington DC to try to lobby for cancer patients. I have been done that with them for the last two years. This year I'm doing again, but this year we're going to do via, um, um, I think Zoom platform, just because, you know, the, the stuff that we sure. are. So that is really something that I am. I, you know, explain to uh, the folks that make the laws what is important for patients with cancer, in particular endocrine tumors, is something that I, I, I really enjoy. Plus, I love patient education. There's nothing that makes me happier than, you know, spend some time and trying to explain the disease for the patients. Once in a while, if I'm not running too behind in clinic, I can even, you know, pick up some slides and do a little PowerPoint presentation to patients. Um, I, I just feel like education and information is power. Definitely. Definitely. And, and that's part, you know, as you know, that's part of our mission here at CCF. And what I like about you, you know, your why, if you want to call that your purpose is that even if you're, you're not conscious of it, it seems like you're, you're fighting for your family as, as well as these patients. I mean, you know, and I have a similar mission with mine. A lot of my family members have dealt, have dealt with disease and addiction and cancer as well. And so it wasn't until deep into my career, I was like, oh, there's this reason I'm drawn to medical stories and, and helping people with their health. And so um, I like that you're aligned with, with what you're good at, what you're passionate about, but then also what your purpose is and what's meaningful to you. Um, so we've got plenty of questions to go ahead and, and, and coming in. So I'm going to go ahead and pivot, pivot to, that, to that and hear from some, from some of our people. And our first one is actually a good one from Sandra. It says, why do you think some people get neuroendocrine tumors? I had one in my bronchial tube that was removed along with one lobe of my right lung. So, so lung nets, and, and I actually was just working on a video about this. And I know that's a, a broad question, but I think the question might be like, is there a cause to this? There's so many cancers that we don't really know a cause to, but then there's some that we can kind of point to a little more directly, not 
not all lung cancer comes from smoking, but we know that's a clear cause of it. And, but with neuroendocrine tumors, is, is there something that, that we have found? Is there correlation somewhere from like, from, yeah. from how people get these or, or, or why some people get them and why some people don't? Yeah, Sandra, um, it's an excellent question, and some, and I often discuss this with my patients. So, for the majority of the neuroendocrine tumor patients, there is not a cause that we know. There's about probably 10% of patients that were born um, with um, mutations, um, what's called germline mutations, and they are on a higher risk um, for developing a, a neuroendocrine tumor. Um, a classic one is the M1 syndrome. Um, the patients have several um, different tumors, and one of them can be a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. But that is the majority of the patients. When you think of probably 85 to 90 percent of the patients, really, we we cannot explain why um, they develop neuroendocrine tumors. So um, we're not there yet. And and because of things like that, and many other things, what is, what are the unique challenges and difficulties when approaching this disease? Yeah, so there's so many diseases that we become so specialized and we're doing like therapies focusing the mutations that the patient has, for example, for lung cancer, for the traditional lung cancer, you know, having your tumor being analyzed for mutations um, as soon as you get your diagnosis is super important because that is actually going to decide how we are going to treat the patient. For neuroendocrine tumors, especially the the slow growing, well differentiated tumors, uh, there's not a big um, mutation burden if we check a tumor that we'll find that will help us to decide on treatment. So again, because the, the, the number of mutations that we see in these tumors are small, or at least we don't know them yet, um, there is not quite helping us to decide on treatment um, strategies at this point. We rather use the Gallium 68 uh, Dota 8 PET CT, uh, which is the net spot commercially known, or the Octurus scan to have a sense of the biology of the disease. If the tumors um, show up, um, we, I call it light up because you see in yellow where the tumors are, that uh, tends to speak to a tumor that tends to have a um, um, a better biology and not so aggressive as um, um, a different type of um, lung cancer or traditional pancreatic cancer when we think about, um, you know, adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. Got it, got it. Uh, I see that Dr. Robert Ramirez is joining us today. He says hello, oh. hello from NOLA and congrats on your grants. I actually Thank spent you. some some time with him a couple of days ago. What so. a great guy. Hi. He, he's well, pretty good. He's pretty good. Yeah. I, I like that guy. Uh, yeah, we we had a little little fun uh, filming there in New Orleans, which was bizarre to be in a, a tourist place like New Orleans in, during COVID because many pla- most places were just like a ghost town. It was really yeah. crazy to see these big tourist areas and attractions where there's nobody there. So that was yeah. that, that was interesting. And I can, if I can just say what a great guy he is, sometimes when I have some lung um, um, carcinoids that I wanted to, you know, um, brainstorm with someone rob had never let me down when i when i um call him or email him to discuss a case he's always been there and super nice so i'm so blessed by the, this community of everybody so nice and so willing to share Definitely. their experiences i agree with that he's been very willing uh to work with us he's going to be on the show uh coming up very soon i think in october but also i want to take a moment for those back home the reason i was visiting with him is we're working on a video series which is another way that we provide content for you all besides the lunch with the experts show uh, we create longer form videos and this this year we've been working on a treatment based uh series in 2018 we did a patient centric series and so the video that we're, we're producing right now with Dr. Ramirez and some other people in New Orleans is about lung nets and dip neck, but we've got many other ones that are already out. You can find them on the videos tab here on the Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. We've got an ABCs of neuroendocrine tumors, which is like an overview of, of all that. We've got specific videos on carcinoid syndrome and serotonin, PRRT, uh, multidisciplinary teams. So lots of other videos, including the one coming out with Dr. Ramirez. So I urge you all to check out those as well. Um, so moving along with the questions, we have a question from Amber who says, hi, what are your opinions on tumors found in the appendix and possible progression of disease? So a- a- in terms of your opinion, like, can you just tell us a little bit about, about, you know, the tumors yeah. that you may find in the app- appendix and, and unique things that they present uh, pertaining to their progression? 
Yeah, Amber, excellent question. So uh, tumors in the appendix, uh, many times they're actually diagnosed by chance, right? You, right. Co you Or you develop um, a little bit of symptoms, you, co you go to the ER and they see a blurring, as I call it, um, um, in the CAT scan in the appendix and you go for a appendicectomy thinking that you have appendicitis or you have appendicitis and, and, and also um, figure out that there was a, um, a tiny little tumor there. So thankfully, most of the tumors that are in the appendix tends to be extremely benign and especially if they're um, the, the level of invasion of the layers in the appendix is small, and if they're less than two centimeters, you're probably never going to hear about that again. Um, um, you know, you have your surgery, and then you are then on occasion, if the tumors are a little bit um, um, bigger, or the level of invasion, we call the, the T um, uh, of the tumor, is, is a little bit more... Um, uh, advance, then we, there might be, have been a discussion about whether or not you need additional surgery, what you call a right hemicolectomy, to um, remove some of your column and there was some of the lymph nodes there um, around the area. But for the majority of the patients, especially if the tumors are small, um, there is no need for any additional um, follow-up after the surgery. I, I have to say though, which is very important to have a good pathologist who is familiar with neuroendocrine Doctor tumors to review um, the, the slides from this uh, surgical material right. because sometimes um, if if a pathologist that does uh, general um, oncology or general pathology um, reviews the, the the material they might not give as much information as we need as surgeons and medical oncologists to make the additional the, the, uh, um, decision but. Um, um, I'll, so the bottom line is that if you if someone is suffering from that, make sure that you seek a second opinion, particularly because that will lead to um, um, second pathology um, look. Thank you. That's, that's and that's helpful. actually that's one of my um, I, I tend to call it my happiest consults when someone comes to me with a very early on um, um, tumor in the appendix, um, and I say, you know, you're done. You don't have to worry about this thing. 95% of the time. So that's, that's a, I, I call it a happy consult. Good, good. Well, hopefully that helps Amber. Uh, I also want to say to everybody back home, I see Doris uh, has, has tagged somebody in this. Listen, you all, you know, we do these every week and they will live here on the channel. So people can always refer back to it. But part of being part of the value of lunch with the experts is the live community that that's happening. So um like Doris, if you know someone that would benefit from this, uh, go ahead and share this with them or tag them in the comments. Let them know that it's broadcasting right now so they can hop in and, and maybe get a question across. You can always refer back to the video um, after this broadcast is done, but you, all, you won't always have access to Dr. Suarez. So that's a good way to, to, to help spread the message if you know someone, a, a caregiver, another patient that would benefit from this. So next question, Karen says, when getting our PET scans, is it best to have them done right before our next injection within a week? Uh, or yeah, within a week, the tech told me it produces better results. Yeah, excellent question. And we, we have this in clinic all the time. Thank you, Karen, for, for, for asking that. So the way that um, the recommendation from the FDA is done is that you should wait. If you're, if you're taking a shot at somatostine analog, the somatostine analog is also going to go to the receptor that in the surface of the tumor and it's going to saturate the receptor. So there is this hypothetical um, understanding that you know if you do the your net spot or your gallium 68 pet ct um, um right away that you got got the shot and you don't get good results so it's always recommended to wait at least two to three weeks after the shots to get the the result there was a few years ago though um there was a apps represented at um the european neuroendocrine tumor society that actually did a study and did pictures of the patients uh, just after the shot, and they, they didn't see there was a, a, a super big difference in that cohort of studies. So I, I, I try to really wait until the next shot for my patients if I can, but if I really need the information, it's not something that I, I feel like is an absolute new uh, role. But yes, when you call nuclear medicine, the, the tech should be asking when was their last shot, and then they will try to coordinate it to for the shot to be already wearing out by the time that you get your net spot. Does it make sense? Yeah, absolutely. 
Okay. Well, thank you for your question, Karen. I hope that works. Good to see you here again on Lunch with the Experts. Um, next question from Jamie. It says, uh, with several tumors on the liver, she's age, age 86, uh, monthly sandostatin injections are not helping after, after two years. Just started Zermelo. What, what other anti-diarrheal drugs can be used? I want to avoid electrolyte imbalance. All right. Um, thank you. Amy, you said? Uh, Jamie. Jamie, Jamie, I apologize. Jamie, yeah, um, probably, I, I don't know the situation in general. Sometimes with patients, sure. they have um, a lot of disease in the liver. There are options. Um, if I understood correctly, the age, um, Jamie's age is 86. 86, correct. Yeah, that becomes a little bit harder to consider more aggressive approaches, such as uh, liver resection or mm -hmm. even embolization. So things to help with the diarrhea, in addition to the somatostatin log that you're getting, you already mentioned the deleter stat, which is the Shermelo, um, you know, very old school um, Imodium and Lomotil uh, might, ha uh, might help. Sometimes I use Tintric of Opium, which is um, as an opioid that can help patients when they take this medication, they, um, they can um, you know, decrease the volume. And something that there is some data coming and some exciting early on um, studies is with um, 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 nutrition, um, a, a liquid, like essentially that's called Enterade, that sometimes if I don't have any other um, explanations or alternatives, I, I try for my patients and some patients have uh, good results. Uh, that has been published and I think we need more trials to see that, but it's something that I have tried um, in few patients. Dr. Um, Aman Shaman has, um, has a study on that. Um, actually, that is accruing, shout out to him and Dr. Das and Vanderbilt has a um, um, clinical trial studying um, this um, um, medication or his, um, his uh, nutritional supplement to help with the diarrhea. And also discuss with your um, oncologist if there is any other causes for the diarrhea that are not necessarily carcinoid related. We all think patients with neuroendocrine tumor have um, um, carcinoid syndrome diarrhea, but there are tons of other um, possibilities for that, including the, even the shots that you are on, the somatostin analog uh, can cause the diarrhea through a mechanism that is um, related to pancreatic enzyme deficiency. So your is a side effect of the shot, your pancreas doesn't digest the food well, and then you, you, you develop this um, diarrhea or this, you feel like bloated, your, um, the, the smell of your um, um, gas can change a little bit for the worst, and, and you can see undigested pieces of food or mushy stools or oily yellowish stools. So there are a few other causes um, that can be also interfering um, with, with your gut and then make, can, be making your diarrhea worse in addition to the to the carcinoid syndrome per, per se. Got it. So when you go, but so my, I always say to my, my patients, I'm obsessed with how uh, by their pooped. I ask a lot of questions uh, about that and some patients feel uncomfortable, but I, there's so many nuances of why you're having diarrhea that we need to really understand what time of the day your diarrhea is, how is the diarrhea um, in terms of the characteristics, because we if we understand better and know where it's coming from, we might be able to help you better. Absolutely. And it's, you know, just a part of life. It's just a part of life. Yeah. We all, we all, we all do it. It's not fun to talk about, but, uh, but it's, it's important. Um, okay. Thank you, Jamie, for your question. Thank you, Dr. Suarez for such a thorough answer. Um, I got a question from Alan. Oh, and there's a lot of heart emojis uh, about that. So <laughs> poop is a big deal in poop my field. Poop is a big deal. Poop is a big deal. It's a necessary part of life. That's for sure. And it tells us a lot. It tells a story. Um, I have a question from Alan that says, what would be a good range for uptake number on gallium 68 to figure what would be best for results with PRRT? Yeah, boy, you are right on the ball, Alan. So um, we we classify as um, SUV, and there is um, great. So anything that is positive in terms of neuroendocrine tumors is you have a SUV that's higher than yellowish. When you see the scan, if your oncologist show the scan to you, that has to be above the liver background. Anything um, like that is is positive, and then we know the the more the positive is, the the higher. Um, the, the response rate, or is it predicted that you're going to respond well to, to PRT? There is not a, a very official cutoff um, about, okay, SUV of 
um, 50 is going to be much better than an SUV of um, 45 or 30. I can tell you that someone, if the comparison you have a SUV of five versus a SUV of 50, chances are um, this much higher SUV um, measurement um, is going to, is, it talks more than the fact that you'll be a good uh, responder. But anything in terms of considering for PRT, any any SUV that is uptaking the tumors that's above what's called liver background um, is considered positive. I'm sorry, super technical. <laughs> that's all right. Yeah, we'll try. We'll try to uh, to you know establish some of those technical things for for most of us uh, like me, so that they can understand. But no. Yeah, me... as I, when I in the office, I typically I, I bring the the net spot on on the computer, and it's much easier to to see, it so I can explain to patients. And I'm sure if they're seeing their endocrine experts, they're they're my colleagues are doing that with their patients. Got it. Got it. Um, we have a question from Danette about uh, PRRT, and this is, I know, I, I've heard this concern or question a lot. Is there, in any, in any case, can a patient have PRRT as a first treatment after surgery? What, and, and maybe the question is, you know, the bigger question is like, you know, where in the sequence of, of, of events of treatments is, is PRT optimal? Oh boy, I can go like for an hour on that one. Right, um, I know. That's why I brought it up because I've I've had this conversation with other doctors, and I know there's yeah. not just one clear yeah. answer to this. So what, what's what's I missed the name? What's her name? Her name is Danette. 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 Hey, Danette. So, um, and when you say um, right after surgery, I'm not sure if that means um, that you get your surgery and then there's no disease left. Right. Right. Understood. Yeah. Um, um, that's so not, yeah, that's not did. the case. Well, no, she didn't. Uh, she didn't clarify that aspect, but I understand why that would change the question. Yeah. Um, so let's let's say, well, if, you're, if she's seeking another treatment after that, I, yeah. I would assume that maybe you know there is evidence of of further disease. So let's take that. Yeah. So let's start. Um, okay, patients that um, have disease that is um, not resectable to start with first. Sure. So typically. The, the initial step is the somatostin analog because we have very good evidence for that and it's a fairly quote-unquote benign, um, for most of the time, doable side effects. So that tends to be the first line of treatment. And then for second line of treatment, if someone has a, uh, um, a guidelines 68 dotator in that spot that's possible, it's very, very, very reasonable to consider PRT as an, an next step. If someone had surgery, um, and doesn't have any disease afterwards, there is no data to support the doing a PRT after the surgery when there is no disease left behind is going to um, impact the outcomes. Okay. So I wouldn't do um, on that aspect. But if someone has surgery and eventually um, not all the disease was removed, then it's a question to discussing if that's a good timing to do PRT or not. I typically wait uh, until there's more data coming up. I typically wait for the time of, of progression to consider PRT for patients. And okay. uh, why is that? Because we don't know if um, that is going to truly impact survival. And PRT, even though it tends to be extremely well tolerated, um, there is a um, depending which literature, literature you look into, a 2 to 5% chance of developing blood uh, cancers uh, from the treatment per se. And that's, you know, I call it a biggie. That's a big deal, right? So yeah. you have to really um, use it smartly and wait for the right time to, to do the treatment. You call it a biggie? A biggie. I that's call a it biggie. a biggie. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've got an interesting question from Karen. Uh, again, it, it, so the experience, she's experiencing uh, heart issues, high and low heart rate. So the question is, is it safe to take a beta blocker while on lanreotide? Generally speaking, yes. Hmm. Um, um, I, I, without knowing the specifics, I'll say definitely run by your oncologist and the cardiologist to make sure that the, the highs and the lows are not too, um, too clinically um, significant. But yes, for most of the time, it's extremely well tolerated and there's um, a smaller chance of interactions in, in the lyreotide to cause a significant low um, heart rate. But that's the general picture. I would encourage her to, to talk to her cardiologist or oncologist about it. Okay, thank you. Ho hopefully that helps. Um, 
And hi, Sandra, I see that you're saying thank you for your question. Absolutely, of course, that's what we're here for. We have a question from Denise who says, has there been a, li a link to genetic mutation? Yeah, so we know that especially for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, there are two um, um, mutations, that we, um, two or three mutations that we see um, quite often. Uh, which is the main one, the DAX and the Atrox, but we are not necessarily um, designing on treatments um, and making treatment decisions uh, based on that yet. And then in general, when we think about small bowel tumors, the, um, the mutations are much more um, um, less in number, are less in number, and we haven't really characterized as specific mutations that we can lead to treatment. So we're not there yet, particularly for the well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. For the high-grade, the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumors, um, there have been few reports that have shown that some specific mutations might benefit from a specific treatments. Again, typically there's a case reports, meaning very small studies, or oncologists um, see three or four patients that, um, that he found the mutation, he tested a, a drug and saw some benefits. Um, so this, but this is for the more aggressive uh, neuroendocrine tumors. For the well-differentiated, we're not, we not there yet. Got it, got it, thank you. Um, next question from Jackie. Jackie says, if PRRT is successful for a PNET, what is usually the time of stability for the patient? So excellent question, and I, I'm kind of smiling because the, the big um, um, trial that was done, um, you know, comparing PRT versus somatostatin analog in a higher dose, which is a phase three trial that you compare against something, was done in mid gut, meaning small uh, bowel um, tumors. So we don't have a prospective randomized trial telling us what are the numbers for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Um, from the European experience, we tend to believe that they will um, respond, have a, a, a response rate that is about probably 30%. And in terms of the duration of how long patients um, will have until they progress, if we extrapolate from the Netherlands study, which is the one of small bowels, progression for survival is about 44 months. And what does mean? I always try to um, explain that to my patients. The a median progression for survival, it doesn't mean that will take 44 months for all the patients to progress. It means that half of the patients will take longer than that amount of time to progress, and half of the patients will will take less uh, than that. So I, I always say, you, you're not, you know, you're not a stats, you're not a number, you can be anywhere in the curve and you, you, there is no, there's no good um, predictors um, that we can uh, recommend. There's a lot of studies in trying to predict um, and who will be, you know, will benefit the most, but they're not 100% um, ready for, um, um, for real life. Got it. Thank you. Um, real quick, everybody, we've got a little less than 20 minutes left with Dr. Suarez, who has been awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to make an, a, another mention. I see a lot of questions that, that we, we won't be able to get to that are just super, super case specific. So I just wanted to make note of that as like Dr. Suarez is here, is here to help, but obviously she doesn't know your specific specific case. And everything is nuanced, right? We, and so it's hard for us to answer uh, something that's, that's specifically addressing your case. So when you ask your questions, it makes it a lot easier for us and Dr. Suarez to help um, if you can kind of ask that question in, in general terms so that we can give you some guidance. Remember, that if, if you joined us late, you might not have heard the disclaimer, but that, that these opinions and information are here to help guide you, but you should definitely, definitely make choices about your health and treatments with your home team, right? And, and seek out a multidisciplinary team and a specialist, of course, but, um, you know, we, we can't exactly in this format uh, go to dive too deeply into your specific cases. So we just wanted to make another note of that and, and hopefully we can still give you the guidance. And by all means, after the program, follow up with Carcinoid Cancer Foundation, send them a message here on Facebook. You can private message them or, or uh, reach out to them on their website, carcinoid.org, and they will direct you to the person or people or resources that you need that will get you that answer. So we're still here to serve you for that, but just know that in this one hour, you know, virtual format, we can't go, but, but, but so deep. 
Uh, okay, so moving on, because we still do have some questions. We have a question from Myra that says, the uh, lesions in the retroperitoneal area produce pain almost daily. Any comments or recommendations about that? And I see your facial expression tells me that you have some thoughts. Yeah, so um, I, I, I think each patient is, is different, but I think if it's causing pain, um, you definitely should discuss with your um, treating team. And there are a few things that could be done. Um, but if it's something that it, it can be radiated with radiation, sometimes this is something that I have used for this particularly uh, painful lesions. Um, it's, it's not unreasonable, um, depending on a patient's situation and the history of surgeries and the amount of disease, which again, that's hard to discuss it, but it's not unreasonable to consider resection of uh, painful um, lesions as well because this uh, local disease can cause a lot of, of I call it morbidity meaning si uh, affect quality of life of the patients so uh, I, I think it's reasonable to ask your um, treating team to discuss it on a tumor borne platform and see what's the best way that you can be helped there are some blocks depending on exactly where the location of there is that interventional pain could do some blocks and, and try to um, kill it, the nerves that are involved mm -hmm. on that particular, close to that particular lesion and improve the pain. Got it. Thank you. Hopefully that helps. And I'm sorry about your pain, but hopefully yeah. we, can, we can get you to some, some sources and resources that'll, that'll help you with that. Uh, Dr. Suarez, uh, Jack Foley from New Mexico says, great to see you. Thanks for all you do and congrats on the scholarship. Uh -huh. We all miss you. Miss it too. That's sweet. That's sweet. I love. Yeah, I love seeing that when uh, when people join us for the, for these events. I mean, to me, to me, that's the the best part. We want to be informative. We want to help people. But I I really love to see the community building and and to see that you know your 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 colleagues from the past you know being supportive. That's what it's about to me. Um, next question from Trish. Um, uh, does diet and exercise help success with PRRT? And diet and exercise is a question that we get a lot about cancer in general, but, but this is interesting to look at it, you know, in terms of this type of treatment. Yeah, uh, thank you. Who, who asked the question? Uh, Trish. Trish, sorry, Trish, yeah, excellent question. Uh, we don't have, uh, diet and exercise helps, period. We don't have any data that suggests that it will help with the PRT to work uh, better. Uh, but it's certainly something um, that I encourage my patients um, to do is to exercise every day, at least 30 minutes a day, uh, hopefully five days a week, if not possible, seven days a week. And what makes exercise, just go to a walk and get your heart rate a little bit um, um, higher than you are comfortable with, not too much. And then dieting, having a, a common sense, I call it common sense, health, healthy diet. Um, I say there's a lot of data coming up that, you know, we should try to avoid high peaks of insulin. So, um, you know, try to avoid um, white carbs and convert them to yellow carbs. I think that's extremely helpful. Um, if you can tolerate, because sometimes the net patients cannot, but uh, fruits and, and, and vegetables um, with fiber are very helpful. Um, so in general, yes, but there's no data to say that will necessarily um, impact on the efficacy of PRT. Sorry, I probably, I could have said no, but I wanted to elaborate <laughs> yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's a good point to make and, and it's a, you know, all these aspects of health are, are interwoven and, and I can interject a little bit here. You know, I'm not a nutritionist, but I have been a personal trainer in my life and still, you know, exist in the fitness space a lot. So I'll also add that, you know, speaking to your point about just getting your heart rate up a little bit, which a walk can do, but if you don't have the space or the time even to walk, my specialty was in body weight exercises, you know, push-ups, pull-ups, and dips, and things without, without weights. And this is also a way, and why they're so, calisthenics is so effective, is it gets your heart rate up while you're building strength. And so what I would suggest for someone, even a beginner, is isometric exercises like a plank or something like that where you're just holding your body still and your muscles are contracted because that actually gets your heart rate up and you could just be holding a plank for 30 seconds. So there, there are other ways, you know, but a walk, like keep it simple. You know, a walk is a simple thing to do. Sitting in like a chair pose or a yoga pose, these are also ways to get your heart rate elevated without having to do CrossFit or, or run a marathon or, you know, swim 10 miles, you know, it doesn't have to be this huge mountain that we, we set up for ourselves. 
Um, and, and not to mention the helps with the fatigue and the depression that we see a lot oh in goodness. the neuroendocrine tumor patients. So we know some my patients tell me, Doc, I need something for fatigue. I said, you need to go exercise once a day. And then they look at me like I'm a crazy person. I'm telling you that I'm tired and you're telling me to go exercise. I was like, yes. It kicks that engine on. It kicks yes, that engine exactly. on. Yes, exactly. You know, if you have fatigue or and also um, a component of depression, if you see a lot in the neuroendocrine tumor patients, please go exercise. There is a very good Absolutely. chance that will be uh, make wonders for you. Yeah, I mean, your body will adjust to whatever state you put it in. You know, physically, especially. So if if it feels like you're going to lay around, it will adjust to that, and it'll be harder to get out there. But but getting out there, especially when the depression aspect, release some endorphins. I mean, it's it's very it's very helpful and. and and uh, and it doesn't have to be this big thing, you know. I, my biggest suggestion is to make it attainable and achievable. Small goals consistently, so much more than okay, I haven't worked out in two years, but now I'm going to do an hour and a half, you know, weightlifting workout. Like it's it's not sustainable. Yeah. So just take it easy, be easy on yourself, but but do be active. It's it's so good. Um, we, so we've talked about appendix, uh, the append, tumors in the appendix already. And so I do have a, a question about that. It's a little unique, but, but let's address it. Um, Tammy says a, a new, she's a newly diagnosed appendix tumor awaiting a chest CT right now. Um, and I find my two toes go numb often. Is that some type of symptom that you've heard of with this? Is that something you've heard of? Or could that Without be knowing all the specifics in two of seconds, um, um, no. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure sorry, <laughs> about that either. Yeah. Sorry, Tammy. If you have any other uh, information that, that may help clarify, please, we still got some time. We've got about 10 minutes, send it along, but that, yeah, it's hard to say, but since we had brought up appendix tumors before, I thought we'd, we'd, mm -hmm. uh, we'd give it a shot. Absolutely. Um, so, so what else are, are you working on? What else are you excited about this year? Obviously we've got the big news that we've, uh, we've already brought up about the grants, yeah. but is there anything else, any new treatments coming, coming down the pipeline or that you're excited about? So, yeah, so there are a few trials, uh, that are currently available, um, that I think are, um, extremely important. Um, there's a trial led by the NCI and, um, Dr. Jen, uh, Jennifer Chen, who is looking at a cabozatinib, which is a pill. Um, there's a tyrosine kinase that targets few things, but um, essentially um, testing whether or not this pill can be used um, as one of the treatments for um, GI uh, neuroendocrine tumors. And the trial is open and enrolling. And um, if someone would consider that, I would um, encourage a lot because I think it's a, the data that we have from a phase two trial is uh, promising. So um, I think it's an exciting trial that might be able to you know make a new drug in into the market if if the results are positive of course um there is also a trial for the tumors that are a little bit more aggressive that they, they are the high grade tumors um dr freeze has a trial try to understand if we need to go with um i call it hardcore iv chemotherapy for these patients when they are diagnosed or if you can do the chemo pills that's for, for as the first treatment if they have uh, disease that has been spread and then there is a um, um, trial for the more aggressive tumors that combines immunotherapy with cabozatinib. Um, there's also a trial run by the NCI uh, in patients that have this more rare aggressive form of neuroendocrine carcinomas that is exciting. And um, for the patients that have a higher grade of neuroendocrine tumors, um, but have a somatostin receptor positive tumor in the net spot, there is a PRT trial um, um, going on in few centers in the United States that will um, help us to understand if we can um, treat patients with PRT when they have a little bit more of aggressive tumor, but they yet still um, um, have a somatostin positive um, imaging with, uh, with a positive net spot. These are some of the things that I can think out of the top of my head. Yeah, and 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 also we uh, we at CCF have a video on clinical trials coming out too, and so that's that's something that's an area where we can always make a lot of strides, and a lot of doctors are really excited about. So we'll 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 keep you all updated on when that video comes out. I imagine it'll be in the next month or so. Um, but that's a really important topic in this you know in this mission that we all we all share. Um, I have another question from Laurie. Says regarding the gallium sixty eight PET scan. Does intense tracer activity in the spleen, for, for example, cause a hustle in the care, or does it indicate a wait and see approach? Could you follow? 
Yeah, um, uh, uh, without looking at her scans, I, I don't know if they was read as a as um, particular areas of the spleen that has been more positive, mm -hmm. or if the overall spleen that has been positive. If the overall spleen has been positive, that's just probably part of the uh, of the background. Um, typically, we don't. If there is, if there are lesions in the spleen that they, mm -hmm. they, they were seeing. Um, unless they are growing, there's not an um, um, urgency to necessarily do an intervention um, for that. But again, I'm not seeing the specifics of Lori. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hopefully that, you know, helps a little bit, Lori. But if you have any other follow-up questions, just uh, just let us know. Uh, Dr. Suarez, I, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, we had some questions about this too, but we... we um, we spend a lot of time talking about the grant and what it's going to mean in terms of your research. What about some, you know, I know research has been a part of your job for a long time. What about some of the research you've done in the past? Like what were the areas that you really, you know, like to, to focus on in terms of your research? Uh, so um, early on in my career, I, I did a lot of research in pancreatic uh, cancer adenocarcinoma, and then I switched more for uh, the neuroendocrine tumors. I, one of the things that I, um, I focus a little bit, but I want to focus a little bit more is on issues related to quality of life and supportive care in these patients. Um, you know, I think it's great to find a, a treatment strategies to help patients, but you know, the, the everyday symptoms and challenges that the patient has, um, such as memory issues, uh, nutritional issues, and the fatigue and the depression that I mentioned, I think there is much less uh, research um, in the net community. And I, I feel like that impacts patients so much that I wish, um, I hope I, um, w with me and many of my colleagues can develop more um, research on that. Because, you know, we do, we, we seek treatments for two reasons, I feel. One is to obviously prolong with people's life. I, can, we, can a treatment make you live longer? And the second um, thing that we should, you know, hope for is that if the, even if the treatment doesn't help you to live longer, can you can the treatment make you to live better? Or mm -hmm. there are any treatments that we can do to make you live better? Does it make sense? So mm -hmm. these are the, some of the things that um, I want to continue to focus, and I have done uh, some of that um, in the past. Okay. Well, I have, uh, we've got about, well, about four minutes left, everybody. So I've got a question I'm going to ask that may be our last one. Uh, this is from Karen who says, how does a patient who's had a net removed and is currently NED, uh, but experiencing symptoms like carcinoid syn syndrome symptoms, flushing, et cetera, how do they discern whether the symptoms are carcinoid syndrome or some other health issue like, I mean, she says, you know, mast cell activation syndrome or yeah. another health, health issue. Like, can you get carcinoid syndrome when, when you're NED and the net has been removed? And if so, or you get the symptoms, how do you know if it's that or something else? Oh, gosh, that's so challenging because, um, you know, sometimes um, we could still have some tumors presence that we're just not yet capturing um, in imaging and the patient's feel so frustrated because they were like, I know that I'm having the symptoms and we, we can capture our own imaging. Uh, mast cell is definitely something that can be considered. Sometimes some medications can cause that. So if, if mast cell is a, is a consideration, I'll definitely recommend the, the, the patient to get evaluated by allergy immunology um, and, and, and see because there is ways that this can be potentially dif differentiated. It's extremely challenging. So sometimes if someone has the symptoms, I'll say let's get a net spot after the surgery because net spots can be a little bit more sensitive than cross imaging such as CTs, MRIs, and then sometimes we might find the answer to that. And, and, and sometimes we don't. And depending on the case, um, I have discussed it with patients um, that have significant amount of symptoms, even doing a trial with treatment, which is the exception of the rule. But I think every person is unique and uh, neuroendocrine tumor patients are not um, a cookbook that you can just open and, and say, okay, I have to do this for you. You know, there's a lot of understanding the patient that has, you have in front of you. Hmm. Sorry, I'm a little bit in the, my Latin animated. <laughs> no, I love that. This is not a cookbook. I, I think that's, that's great. Uh, okay, so we just have a couple minutes left, but I, I wanted to ask, you're a patient advocate. What is the first thing that you would tell a new patient in this disease? This is a question I like to ask a lot because many of the people that attend these and that are in this community 
are very early in their journey and they're confused, they're scared, and they don't yeah. know the way forward. And these are the people that I really like to help the most. Yeah. Uh, what do you say to them out of the gate? So um, the patients that come for the initial visit, I say, take a deep breath. Um, let's look at your scans. Let, let's, let me explain to you the spectrum of neuroendocrine tumors. And then once you understand that, you can, you can see where you are in this journey. If someone has very low burden of disease, a tumor in the small bowel, chances are even the disease has spread, that this patient has a, a, a many, many years to come. Uh, patients that already come to us with a significant amount of uh, disease in the liver, the heart um, has been compromised. Um, unfortunately, they probably will be, you know, will be here for um, a little bit less um, time. But I, I try to tell them, take a deep breath and let's let's just understand where you are because not not all neuroendocrine tumors are the same. Also, I try to explain: you have a aggressive neuroendocrine tumor, or we have a um, a slow growing neuroendocrine tumor. Um, some patients come to me because they have a type one gastric neuroendocrine tumor. That is, a, I call it extremely. Um, in the spectrum of neuroendocrine tumors, benign one, because mm -hmm. most of the time that doesn't um, spread. And you just have to see your um, uh, gastroenterologist once a year to do that. So it, you're really understanding. So education, education, education. And most of my patients after the first meeting, I refer him to a few websites, including the Carcinoid uh, Foundation, um, to obtain more information. So I really thank you guys for uh, the work that you are doing for patient education. Well, I, on behalf of CCF, uh, I appreciate that. And I know that they do at the foundation. The foundation has been running for, for, for over 50 years and I'm so grateful to work with them and so proud of the work they're doing, they're doing as well. And I'll, and I'll say, I want to tell you, Dr. Suarez, before we go, uh, many people today have, have complimented you on your, your answers and, and I have to, to agree with them. So we, we've helped a lot of people today. And even that last question from Karen, we had multiple people say great question uh, and great answer. And Karen, I think that this is a good example. I think this was the second time you asked that because I was scrolling back through trying to find your question. It seems like you did rephrase it a little bit. So if that's true, thank you for that because that really helped me do my job. And we were able to answer the question, which other people wanted, you know, thought was a great question. So this was like, we all, that was great teamwork there on, on all our parts to, to, to get to the best answer. So that is it for today's luncheon with the experts. As always, thank you all at home. We hope that this program has helped you. And if you have any follow-up questions, just know that number one, the video will live here, uh, evergreen on the, uh, on the CCF Facebook page on the videos tab. And also starting Monday, it'll be republished on the YouTube channel as well. And if you have any follow-up questions, you can reach out to CCF here on the Facebook page or at carsonoid.org. Thank you again to our presenting sponsor, Lexicon Pharmaceuticals. We could not do this program without you. And thank you to you, Dr. Suarez, so much for being here. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Absolutely. Great to be here. Yes, yes. And thank you to all you at home. Hey, everybody. Be healthy. Be safe out there. Have a great week. And join us next time for Lunch with the Experts. Bye-bye, everybody.